<laughs> Hello, and thank you for joining HP at the Cannes Film Festival. I'm Angela Matusik. I'm the head of brand journalism. Before working at HP, I covered the film industry and festivals for brands like People Magazine, InStyle, and NBC. And I am so thrilled to be here to talk to you today about women empowerment in the film and tech industries with this amazing panel. First, we have Nick Lazaridis, the president of HP EMEA. We have Joanna Popper, who is the head of VR for the film and entertainment industry. We have Nandita Das, who is here as a director for her film Manto, which is in Un Certain Regard. Congratulations, that's so Thank exciting. Mm -hmm. And we have Hazel Hayes, who joins us as an up-and-coming filmmaker. She not only tells her own stories, but she also interviews people about their stories to her hundreds of thousands of fans on YouTube. So welcome, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about women empowerment. In the past year, there has been a lot of discussion, as you know, around this important subject. The Me Too movement is changing the way the film industry thinks about women today. And in the tech industry, people are saying, yes, we need more women in leadership roles, and it's becoming a top priority. So Nick, I hope you don't mind me starting with you as our token man. <laughs> but I would love to hear from you. you have a, you've been working in the tech industry for most of your career, yeah, is that all correct? all of my career. All yeah. of your yeah. career. And I would love to hear from you personally, how are things changing now? Do you think that there is a shift happening in the tech industry when it comes to women in leadership? Yeah, well, definitely. I think. Um, you know, about seven years ago, there was a survey done uh, in the tech industry, and 82% uh, of men said that the, their companies were diverse, and 60% of women said their companies were diverse. These wow. are people working in the same company. <laughs> so, so um, you know, even back then, I mean, yeah, there's a couple of percentage points you can say are uh, subjective, but that's a huge difference. And tech uh, is quite egalitarian these days, um, and a lot of tech companies have been speaking about it for a while. But words aren't enough. You know, we yeah. can all talk about we want to do this and we want to do that. And you know, companies like HP have gone ahead. We've got um, diversity boards internally. We've got 16 professionals who make sure that they keep us honest about doing what we said we're going to do. Um, our our board is mm -hmm. the most diverse board in all of tech. Um, twice as diverse as Silicon Valley on average. We've got four of ten board members um, who are women. Uh, my business, Europe, Middle East, Africa. Half of my leadership team is women and in some very, very big positions. You know, um, our, our managing director of France is a woman, our managing director of Spain, Turkey, Nigeria, uh, Czech Republic, Austria. So it's changing, but um, you know, we have, to, we have to stay on it. We can all talk about it and it sounds great. And it's, a, it's a cool thing to talk about, but until you actually put programs in place and hold people accountable, you're not gonna get there. Yeah. And that's something we're doing. We're definitely gonna talk about that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And Joanna, tell me, from your experience in the tech business, um, do you feel that there's also changes happening? Do you think that, there, that this is a conversation that you're hearing a lot from your point of view? Well, this is certainly a conversation we're hearing a lot. I, prior to working in tech, I, work, I worked in the media industry, so I have an interesting intersection of working in, in both tech and, and media, and now working in VR is really the, the combination of both. I think in media, you're seeing a lot of focus on, on Time's Up, and you're seeing women c coming into very powerful positions and actually replacing in many cases replacing the men that were removed from the positions for their for the behavior that they in those positions um, in in tech I think there's certain companies that really are doing a great job and I think there's still a long a long way to go between the as you said the the words that people say about the, and then actually seeing women in, in very high positions throughout the all of Silicon Valley and all of the companies there and so Nick you, you mentioned all the amazing um, statistics and the women representation at HP, which is fantastic. But I have to ask, how do you think that that affects the business as a whole? Do you, do you think that when it comes to being more successful or to the bottom line that there's an advantage to having gender equality? I think that's probably the easiest question I'm going to get <laughs> through Khan. Um, and I say easy because we are very data driven. Um, we're obviously a publicly listed company. When I look at the businesses that are run by women in my organization, um, is there a difference? Uh, yes, and I think it, that, you know, it, the, the diversity also, apart from the business side, it attracts and it helps retain talent because people want to join a company that sees everybody as equals. And so when you see female leaders in, in tech, um, which used to be very rare, mm -hmm. people want to join. And it's not just women that want to join because there are women leaders, men want to join because they see that, that, that equality. Uh, so, so it's great. Yeah. yeah. 
And Joanna, do you have any thoughts about that when it comes to profitability or um, sure. ROI? There's been there's been lots of uh, studies, lots of data that show that when you have diversity in leadership, and particularly diversity around and inclusion around women, that you have better financial returns, better stock returns, better decision making, and better product. So, it isn't just a you know nice thing to do or right thing to do, but it actually it has a huge impact on the bottom line for the business. So I'm now I'm going to turn our conversation a bit towards the film industry. And it's very appropriate that we're all sitting here underneath the beautiful photo of Kate Blanchett, who is our, this year's jury president. We actually have the first uh, pred predominantly female jury this year at Cannes. Um, so there's an accomplishment right there. We have had a lot of strides in female filmmakers this year. Patty Jenkins had a record-breaking year with Wonder Woman. but. The truth of the matter is, when you look at the top grossing box office films for the past 10 years, 95% of them are made by men. So obviously, we still have a long way to go. Um, so Nandita, you have been to Cannes many times as an actress, a performer, twice on the jury, and now here as a director. Um, how, how are, from that point of view, do you feel that the Me Too movement is affecting the industry at large from where you sit? Well, I think the Me Too movement was like a tipping point. I think a lot of women were talking among themselves or at various platforms, but no one was really hearing it. And, and suddenly, as if there's been a collective consciousness that has sort of shifted, I mean, we have to thank Harvey Weinstein for this, that sometimes we need a blow for these kind of things to come out because I think there were ripples all around and everyone kind of knew about it but you know it just helped people to talk about it and sometimes we say me too sometimes we call it time's up mm -hmm. you know me too does put a lot of pressure on the victim so to say mm -hmm. and to say that okay i need to come out with my story and it's it's no one's right to tell the other that you must come out with your story because it's a very personal thing and each woman needs to feel safe and comfortable and confident to say me too. So you wouldn't judge someone just because someone hasn't come out with their mm -hmm. story. So in a way time's up, I, I like that word yeah. more because it just means that we've had enough right. and it's time for things to change. Every little step towards or, or in the right direction is something we need to celebrate. And I think the fact we're thinking 50-50 by 2020, and you know, a lot of that is also happening in Cannes. And uh, a huge, uh, I think they're gonna do a big walk on the red carpet with a lot of yeah. directors so and actresses. Explain that, so 50-50 by 2020, what does that mean? Well, like, you know, you said 95% uh, of big budget directors are men. I don't think it's going to change by 2020, but it's good to have an ideal and to say that uh, we should have more equal distribution. But like Nick was talking about boards, right? You were talking about boards, but the film industry isn't organized like the corporate sector. So there's not, so the corporate honchos can't decide that okay we are I mean can decide in a corporate world to say that we should have 50 50 or it's great at least it's 60 40 the film industry is made up of self-employed people there's no one person on top saying that this is how it should be so a lot of us have to keep pushing it and that's why when a female lead wins the Oscar and you know says that there has to be inclusion yes. rider she just says <laughs> those know. two Francis words McDermott. and I think it's fantastic <laughs> Hazel, you, you're based in London, mm -hmm. and you've been you've been covering the film industry and a part of the film industry for a few years, yeah. right? Um, how do you how does this fit from your point of view? I mean, do you do you feel that the doors are open to you as much as anybody else, or do you find that the women that you're talking to in the film industry in England are also talking about this? I, yeah, I absolutely feel like the doors are open to me. No, it, it is great that a lot of people are kind of, you know, without wanting there to be tokenism. Um, a lot of the companies that I've been pitching to lately and talking to lately are at least aware that a lot of the voices they've been kind of showcasing for a long time have been white males. And so they do want to broaden the horizons a bit and make sure that, they're, that they are being inclusive. And it's a, it's a it's sort of a fine line to walk, isn't it, between 
tokenism and actually, you know, wanting to kind of raise up those voices. I have to say, I do respect the Cannes Film Festival in some ways because when they chose this year's films for competition, there are only there are three films that are made by women, and they were very clear to say, well, we're we're still we choose mm -hmm. our films based on their quality and cinematic merit, and we're not using gender as or, or a, a, a quota yeah. that we have to hit, which I think is important as well. It really is, and as a woman, you you never want to feel like you've got a job because you're a woman. I would never ever want to feel like I was in competition with a guy and I got it because of diversity's sake. I want to know that, you know, it's on my it's on merit. It's that I deserved that job, that my pitch was the best or my script was the best. Um, but I think it's just getting that foot in the door to prove that you are as good, if not better. It's, 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 you know, to prove that you are worthy of that job. And I think that's the opportunity that's changing lately, is that we're just seeing more women being given that opportunity in the first place. Well, I think um, one of the things that we should all be thinking about too is that half the population is female. So obviously we need female voices and female gaze to help tell our stories. And Joanna, this is something I know that you're very passionate about when it comes to women um, in front of the camera and behind the camera. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in VR, this new emerging sector of the entertainment industry. Do you think that because it's new that there's almost like a, a clean slate for gender diversity from the get-go? Absolutely. First, I just want to respond to some of the things that we were just talking about as well. Um, so as far as gender parity by 2020, I mean, that, that that's the term, you know, gender... 50-50 uh, gender parity by 2020 and that there's a lot of different groups that are gunning for that. I'm, I'm actually part of a group called 50 Women Can. There are 50 women selected that are, then it's a funny name, but it's 50 Women Can Change the World in Media Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And we, we um, it's a five month program in LA and people fly from all over the world to be, to be part of it. Um, and through that I've had exposure to a lot of really interesting statistics. And one of the things that we learned is that the ROI on films, when you have women in front of the camera and behind the camera, you make 37 cents more to the dollar invested See? when you have women in front of the camera and behind the camera. And when you have women just in front of the camera, it's 23 cents more. Isn't it amazing that it's taken them that yeah. long to figure that out? It seems like a no-brainer. There's more. There's more. So, I, of, you know, women represent 52% apparently of the box office, so we actually over-index in the box office, and yet only 18% of films are actually marketed to women. These are the stats that came, came from the study. Hmm. So what that says is there's a tremendous business opportunity, mm -hmm. right? We're talking a lot about what's the right thing to do, is, is it, but if you, if you just look at those numbers, it tells you that there is a huge business opportunity and that smart business people should be jumping on that opportunity if for no other reason then people are in in the industry often to for, for the returns right well, we, we obviously saw that as well with the likes of get out and black panther absolutely stealing the box office and i think it's just people of all different backgrounds finally seeing themselves represented, represented. on the big yeah. screen and, and you know it just in ways that they hadn't seen before so i think whenever you bring diversity in in any way it generally tends to be not only the right thing to do, but, but profitable yeah. as well. There's a huge impact on, in terms of seeing yourself represented. Um, there's, there's, I don't know if anyone watched, watched the X-Files, but there's a character, <laughs> Dana Scully. And so there's something in, in the STEM world and in, in the tech world called the Scully effect, where they've done studies that, that <laughs> women who were in that field off, often watched that show growing up and, felt, and saw themselves represented there mm -hmm. and were inspired to pursue STEM because of that. So when you think about, you know, what are we creating in film? What are we, or film yeah. and TV? Mm -hmm. What voices are we putting are out there? Who are we representing and how are we showing them? And then think about the impact that that will have, that ripple effect on generations to come. So That's Nick, very I know that education is an important um, priority for yours and something that we talk a lot about HP. Can you talk a little bit about STEM education and, um, and how do we get more girl, young women interested in these fields from the get-go? Yeah, look, I think, I think this is a, probably the best place to start. When you look at, um, so everybody knows what STEM is and STEAM now, we have arts in there as well, but um, if you look at the percentage of women coming through historically, and I'm not going to go way back, but maybe 10 years ago, um, through computer science degrees, less than 20%, um, through other tech-related um, degrees, very, very low. And so it actually makes it hard for, for you to get a, a, a good balance of women and men in an organisation. So I think we need to promote more women in, in computer science, in IT, from the get-go. And I think this Scully effect is, is important too. If they see 
other strong women that they can associate with and, and, and you know maybe heroes or not but you can associate with it and so that's kind of cool it's not you know fat old white guys in suits all day long and so um, <laughs> Um, I, I think it's critical, it's the most critical thing we can do in a grassroots level to make sure that enough women are interested in, especially for IT, in tech careers. And you know, a lot of companies have started doing it. You know, um, we actually, and it goes beyond tech, we, we as a company have gone to all of our marketing agencies and said, here are our expectations on diversity and you either meet them or we go elsewhere. Uh, on the legal side, we did the same thing uh, in 2017 last year and said to all the legal firms we work with globally, you know, you're way underrepresented and you must have this percentage representation of women of minorities or we reserve the right to pay you less mm -hmm. and, and we do it. Yeah. And you've got to force that. And, you know, it, for us, our industry, our industry is, you know, the, the, the tech, um, I guess, university courses, college courses, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, it's law, it's, it's marketing, it's yeah. finance. You just have to yeah. want to do it you and you have to be strong about maintaining Nancy, it. Sir? I just wanted to jump in on that, that I totally agree because sometimes, like you said about meritocracy, mm -hmm. you know, it's a bit of a nuanced thing because there's so much historical wrong that has happened, mm -hmm. that there's been so much exclusion of women for so many years and generations that sometimes maybe you need to push that because meritocracy can sometimes be a little dubious in the sense that you say, well, there weren't enough women, what can we do? So we had to take that. Well, you have to look harder. Maybe you have to give that chance. Maybe mm -hmm. you have to create more opportunities. Because when they will come, maybe they will discover another side. And also confidence or whatever the biases that we have. And in the sense, if men are conditioned in a certain way, women are conditioned too. We're also grappling with our own lack of confidence. We're gra grappling you know, with m many of our fears yeah that we have had or just generational conditioning that we are dealing with. Am I good enough? Mm -hmm. My low self-esteem, will it come in the way? Can I handle it? Oh, I have a child. You know, yeah. there are a hundred different things we yeah. are grappling with. So I think it's not always about meritocracy, mm -hmm. but I do no, appreciate I your point. No, I agree. Yeah, and I was going to say, it's, it's a really difficult thing because you... It's, it's more nuanced. You run basically. the risk of, of falling back into the blame game of saying, well, not enough girls are trying to get into the industry right. and therefore, yeah. you know, there's only a pool of men to choose from. and. And we have to encourage yeah. them to try. It's not one. It's not that they're not just trying, but two. You know, yeah. There's fewer women in tech, and there's fewer women going to, mm -hmm. to film school to yeah. study it, and there's fewer women trying to get in because they've seen historically they may not be ex accepted. They may be that. subject to sexism on set. Yeah. And I'm thick-skinned for all intents and purposes, and I am a confident person. I've experienced sexism on set, and had to battle through and I can't imagine what that would be like for someone you know more insecure or just starting out or whatever um, so I think yeah that that scully effect is really interesting mm. and and I I get a lot of girls saying that to me which is so the scary. hazel effect the hazel effect thank you <laughs> I, I, d dare I say um, well it, it's, it's very humbling and it's very lovely but I think it's because I, I, I got my start on YouTube and I just sort of forged my way. I just yeah. started making little things and then I was directing and writing and editing and producing because you have to. You just on YouTube, you know, you're running your own thing, so you have to do all the jobs. And as I've sort of started to make my way up the ladder and, and make this a career, I, I go to conventions all the time where I get tweets from girls or comments from girls and I interact with girls all the time who are mm -hmm. saying to me, you know, I'm I'm now going to film school or I, I want to be a, a cinematographer, or I want to be a sound designer, or I want to be a director, because I see that you, you can do it, and you're not Patty Jenkins, you're yeah. not Catherine Bigelow, you know, you're not Sophia Coppola, you're just this girl from Dublin right. who, who started out, and I think there's something more accessible mm -hmm. and relatable, and they go, yeah, I could do that yeah. too. So yeah, it's really, yeah. it's really lovely. And Joanna, back to VR, um, so do, do you think that because it's an emerging industry that, there's, uh, that there are more opportunities for women? VR is really interesting because the, the the people who are working in VR come from so many different backgrounds right now since it's such a new field. So people are coming from gaming and tech and immersive theater and film and TV. So it's that confluence of, of lots of skill sets. Some of those industries over index male. So we have that impact. But on the other hand, we it's it's a new industry and there's a lot of attention and focus on become and creating the industry and the culture to be diverse and inclusive from the very right, it's beginning. Because it's being defined so right now. Mm -hmm. So we have amazing groups 
for women. We have Facebook groups that support each other. We have you know yeah. brunches at every you know different yeah. diff different big event. We have um, you know, I personally have a long list of women. Every time I get asked about women speaking at events, I share them out. Often I share it before I'm asked <laughs> when I yeah. see that they exactly. somehow didn't manage to find I all know. the great women in the industry to be on the panels. Um, but it's and we and we have some fantastic male allies who are making this mm -hmm. their mission as well to make sure that this new industry has diverse voices yeah. represented from the very beginning oh. and not just women but people yeah. of all of all all underrepresented backgrounds uh, so on that note I would love to hear from all of you as we as we wrap up a little bit if you could give a piece of advice to a young woman who is looking to, you probably actually do this a lot because it sounds like a lot of your yeah. your audience <laughs> reaches out to you what is the piece of advice when you give to somebody that's like I want to get into the film business and I don't know where to begin the thing I always say to to anyone to boys or girls is just do it just start somewhere even if that's you know I think a lot of the time people see barriers uh, of entry in terms of I don't have a camera I don't have the software I don't have whatever I mean most things come now with some um, very basic editing software mm -hmm. and your iPhone has a camera on it mm -hmm. and yeah I, I think telling stories is is not just about um, big budgets and explosions and high production value telling a very basic simple story is at the heart of of every piece of filmmaking it's at the heart of all art really um, so that yeah the thing I would say to most people is to just just start just start yeah. somewhere start small and work your way up don't try and make a massive big budget thing straight away and don't be sad that you can't do that yet you will one day. Nandita for you do you have especially th thinking about young women in India um, you must have people approach you all the time asking yeah. for direction. And I think it's about creating those role models and they, we don't have to, you don't have to be a celebrity to do that. I mean the world has changed because of a lot of unknown nameless faceless women. You know we look at these big role mm -hmm. models but the, at, at the core of it, things have changed because some so-called ordinary women have just done things differently. And Nick at HP, I'm sure you uh, probably have a lot of young aspiring tech stars coming your way. What is it that you would um, advise a young woman so coming to you for advice? It's a bit of a mix of both of what Hazel and Nandita said. Yeah. Uh, go for it. You know, we're, we're in unprecedented times. We have a few decades ago, there are countries, uh, mature, mature markets, mature countries in the world where women couldn't vote. Now we have female heads of state. We have, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies that have a large majority of executives and CEOs. And so my, my advice is, if you want to do it, do it. Um, the glass ceiling is, you know, the reality is it's still there today. Mm -hmm. But more and more companies and individuals are taking it seriously and changing the world and so you know if you want to be in IT or technology go and do computer science you know go and do engineering there's still a, a massive underrepresentation, and a lot of doors will open up especially you know from now moving forward it's yeah. it's it's a, it's a brave new world well it's very exciting and it's certainly great to be here at Cannes for this historic year I have no doubt the 71st one is the year that it all shifts from here well, thank you very much for joining me. It was wonderful chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks.